Um, I've spent the last several, probably a little, little over a couple of weeks at this point, um, growing a, a virus that codes for a functional copy of the lactase enzyme, because I am very lactose intolerant. So um, this, is, this is the final product. Um, I had to package it into three pills because that was what I could get the microcrystalline cellulose to fit into because it's kind of damp. Um, I'm a little worried because I am allergic to penicillin and we use penicillin in the media. So I've got some Benadryl. So I'm going to take two of these and then all of these. And the idea is these will open up in my stomach, release the virus, and then the virus will go into my intestinal lining and give me a functional copy of the lactase enzyme. Uh, okay. Well, bottoms up. Uh, well, let's hope that doesn't kill me. More than point, let's hope it works. <laughs> That clip was from a video I released about two years ago where I took a home-brewed, genetically modified virus to attempt to get rid of my lactose intolerance. Now, this probably sounds pretty drastic, but it was also very effective and completely got rid of my lactose intolerance for a really long time. The reason I did this was because back in high school, my body stopped being able to produce an enzyme that can break down a type of sugar called lactose. Lactose is normally found in dairy products as it's one of the main components of milk, but because we produce so much milk annually, it's also a waste product. So it's used as a cheap filler and sweetener in a huge array of products, even things that have no business having dairy in them. So if you're especially sensitive to it like I was, this isn't so much a mild annoyance as an agonizing way to ruin your day or week, depending on your sensitivity, if all you did was misread the label on something. Ever since I first put out that video, I have been inundated with questions and asking for updates on the project. So today, I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to get this part out of the way at the front. It has actually worn off at this point, and I'm back to taking lactase pills. But that said, it took a very long time for it to wear off. As I talked about in the original video, this wasn't something that we just made up, and was actually based on a paper, which I've linked to down in the description. In the original study, they tested this out on rats, and they studied the rats for about six months, and at the end of the study, the rats that they'd used the therapy on were still lactose tolerant. So, did my results match? Actually, yes. At six months, I was still very lactose tolerant and could eat heroic levels of dairy products. In fact, it was about 12 months before I started noticing signs of a fade, and another six before I had to start taking lactase pills again. So that gives me a grand total of 18 months of lactose tolerance from that single dose of virus. The reality, though, is we always expected it to wear off. Intestinal tissue grows and divides and dies very quickly, so it's hard to make something like this stick around for a long time. Instead, the point of the original experiment was to simply see if the results could even be translated to humans. A lot of the times, studies in rats don't translate, so we wanted to see if something that we could just get off the shelf would even work. And even though my data set is only n equals 1, I'd say it works pretty damn well. Even now that it's mostly worn off, the number of lactase pills that I need to get through a meal is minuscule in comparison. Originally, before I took the therapy, I had to take 14 or 15 lactase pills just to get through a meal, something simple like a piece of pizza. But now, even one or two pills is more than sufficient to get me through a meal unless it's absolutely drenched in lactose. Now that we've set a baseline and we know that the idea itself works, the goal is to take what we've learned and develop a version which is safer, easier to mass produce, easier to deliver, and should last longer. So today we're going to look at both pieces of DNA, the old version and the new recently designed version, and see how they're different and how they're the same. Here are the two pieces of DNA side by side. If this is your first time seeing DNA presented in this way, or just want to learn how to design things like this, tune into the Whose Gene Is It Anyway live streams that I've been doing. I've been picking random ideas out of a hat and then designing DNA to accomplish whatever the idea is. It's been great practice for me, but also a way to teach people how to design, research, and understand these sorts of DNA maps. Some of the ideas we've already covered are yeast that produce all the proteins from milk, a mod to make tomatoes produce capsaicin and be spicy, a mod that would make coffee beans inherently decaf, and lots more. But back to the lactase. First, let's talk about how these two are similar. The three main similarities are that they both contain a lactase gene, they both have a collection of other features that make them work in human cells, and a separate set of features that make it possible to make copies of the DNA using bacteria for mass production. But beyond that, they're really quite different. The old version, as I said earlier, used a virus for delivery. That virus is called an AAV, or adeno-associated virus, and is actually the gold standard for gene therapy because it's so safe, which is why we chose it. 
Basically, the way this works is that you add these special tags to the beginning and end of whatever DNA you want to get packaged into the virus. In this case, that's the chunk with the lactase enzyme. You then take this DNA and two other pieces that contain the genes for the virus's shell and put them all into some animal cells in a flask. The cells take in the DNA and start producing viruses filled with this DNA, at which point you can harvest the viral particles from the flask for use in the therapy. But because none of the code for making more virus gets packaged, the viral particles can't replicate, and are simply a delivery mechanism. While this is very effective, it's time-consuming, tedious, and can be very expensive. So you'll notice that those tags are conspicuously absent in the new version. The new version wouldn't be delivered by packaging the DNA into a virus. Instead, we plan on simply mixing the pure DNA with a chemical called chitosan, which is a derivative of shrimp shells. There's a great paper that I've linked to below that actually did exactly this, and was able to very effectively deliver lactase genes to the intestines of rats. Here, the green-blue areas took in the DNA after feeding the rats the DNA chitosan goop. This means that getting DNA ready for a theoretical patient would be much, much cheaper and easier. Pure DNA is very cheap, and chitosan costs pennies. And since there's no viruses and nothing being injected, the purification required to get this ready is almost nothing. Chitosan has actually been extensively studied as a cheap, safe, and effective method for delivering DNA to a patient in a huge number of studies. And it seems that when DNA is bound to it, it makes it much easier for the DNA to both cross the cell membrane, and it gets protected on its trip through the stomach. The chitosan and DNA together form tiny little particles which tend to stick to the cell membrane. And when this happens, the cell thinks it's food and brings it inside. But once inside, the DNA manages to escape the little food vacuoles, and is released and can be transported to the nucleus and start working. The exact release mechanism of how this works is still being studied, but the important part is that it works. Moving on, you'll see that the lactase gene in the new version is much, much larger. Lactase is actually an umbrella term for literally thousands of enzymes that all do the same job. Each organism that's capable of breaking down lactose has their own version. The original therapy used the much smaller version of lactase taken from E. coli, but while this worked well, it raises the possibility that it could get cleared from your system faster if your immune system learned to recognize it. So the new version uses a human lactase, so there's nothing for the immune system to respond to. Another small change that we made was to the piece of DNA right before the lactase gene called the promoter. To make lactase, the DNA is first read by an enzyme called RNA polymerase, and a copy of it is made in RNA. That RNA is then read by a cluster of enzymes called a ribosome, which uses it as instructions for making the lactase protein. The promoter is the sequence that RNA polymerase binds to to get that process started. The old version used the CMV, or cytomegalovirus promoter. This promoter leads to very high levels of expression of the gene, so lots of lactase production. But the immune system can recognize it or interfere with it, making it turn off randomly, so it's not exactly ideal. The new version uses the EF1A promoter, which is a human promoter and should give nice, even expression and nothing for the immune system to mess with. Finally, the last change is this giant chunk labeled SMAR. In something like bacteria, we normally add a sequence called an ORI, or origin of replication. And there's actually one of them in both of these plasmids for when you're growing the DNA in bacteria. The ORI is the spot where DNA starts being copied over during cell division. Without it, only the first cell would contain the new DNA, and it would simply be lost as the cells divide. But unlike bacteria, mammalian cells don't actually use ORIs, so this SMAR sequence is the closest approximation to that thing. This should make the therapy last much longer, potentially years. Between all these changes, the result should be a plasmid which is easier and cheaper to produce, easier to apply, and also safer now that it uses no viral components and shouldn't have any way to accidentally cause an immune reaction. And it has no way to accidentally integrate into the host's genome, so there should be no way for it to form any sorts of cancer. But before you get too excited, it'll be a long time before this is ever tried in humans. The original version was nice because an AAV carrying LAC-Z has been used in tons of viral studies, meaning it's been tried on literally thousands of animals and a variety of species and none showed any issues. Whereas this new version is essentially starting from scratch, so it's going to need a lot of testing before human testing is even reasonable. So we want to take our time, do things right, and make sure that it's safe. Also, it's a really big plasmid, so it would also just be fairly expensive to have made. And I've got so many other projects going right now that I don't really want to work on this right now. Part of the reason I'm even making this video, other than to update on how the original went, is actually to ask for your help checking my work. 
I've uploaded the DNA file to the Whose Gene Is It Anyway GitHub, and I've linked to it below. You're free to download it, modify it, and even have it synthesized if you really want it. And if you find any issues, you can leave them on GitHub so that the plasmid can be improved, and whatever we actually end up having made down the line will be the best possible version. One note though is if you do decide to download this, but more to the point, if you decide to actually have it synthesized, I only ask two things. First, please share a sample of the DNA with me, that just seems fair. But more importantly, number two, please, please, please don't test this on yourself. I'm putting this up as a way to get feedback, and for those who have access to a cell culture laboratory to test this plasmid in cell culture, not to test this in people. But it would be cool if after all of the testing it could eventually be put through clinical trials, and eventually see some patients. The DNA is being released as Creative Commons share alike, so if you want to go through the trouble of paying for a clinical trial and all of the testing and bringing it to market, you're welcome to do so, just as long as whatever you release is also Creative Commons. This way, everyone benefits. But that's where I'll leave it for now. You finally got an update on the project, and we talked about the path forward. Now I'm going to head back to the lab and keep working on the spider silk project. Links to everything I've talked about can be found down in the description. And if you want to learn about how to design bits of DNA like this, then be sure to tune into the live streams I've been doing every Monday and Friday at 2pm Eastern. Sometimes we'll design DNA, sometimes we'll be working in the lab, and sometimes I'll just have some of my awesome bio friends on as guests to talk about their cool projects. It's a lot of fun, so I recommend stopping by. As always, I need to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi who make these videos possible. Y'all are amazing and let me work on crazy projects like this, and I can't thank you all enough. If you'd like to support the research and keep the flow of science videos coming, I've left some links below. And considering that I said the word virus about 50 times in this video, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be demonetized, so your support will be the main thing that lets me keep doing this. Speaking of which, I know the world is pretty crazy right now, so I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. And for the approximately bazillion of you that have asked, I'm already working on a video about the pandemic, specifically how the testing works. If you'd like to follow along with the progress on that and my many other projects, be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter where I post updates constantly. If you've enjoyed, be sure to hit that like button and of course subscribe and ring the bell to see when I post new videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.